Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth webinar. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, real-world demonstrators using open communication protocols. Uh, the aim of this webinar is to find out who is doing what on uh, smart charging, and the objective is to col collaborate when possible to develop a fit-for-purpose electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, this is particularly relevant in the UK because we are currently working on a secondary legislation on smart charging. So you, the UK government want to actually include, uh, develop uh, a law and in this law there will be some sort of ingredients of what makes a smart charger. And uh, knowing who's doing what, especially some of the international experience on the topic, is really valuable. This webinar is an uh, initiative from the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial intelligence, and there are several programs and groups at the institute. Uh, the vehicle integration one is one of them. Uh, one of the objectives of the group is to apply and develop data science methods into electric vehicle integration. So for example, prediction methods, optimization methods for smart charging. And we would also like to contribute to the work that's happening on communication, open communication protocols. More information and contact details can be found online. Okay. Uh, we have a landing page for the webinar. It uh, includes slides and recordings uh, from uh, uh, previous and future webinars. Uh, so far, we talked about OCPP in detail. We talked about OpenADR. And today, we will be talking about real demonstrators using these communication protocols. Uh, Mireille has the flu, so she can't uh, join us uh, today, but you might be able to access her slides after the event. Lennart, uh, 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 thankfully, uh, will fill the gap a bit and talk a bit longer about uh, their work on the Electric Nation project. Maybe you are, uh, you are all aware or if you've seen that Electric Nation just published their final report, and it's great that we can hear from Lennart about some of their work. Uh, it will be followed by Ben, who's uh, uh, working on a UK funded, on a base funded project. And uh, Ben is using uh, both OCPP and OpenADR to control electric vehicle charging. So I'll uh, move on now and uh, give the screen to Lennart and looking forward to uh, hearing about Electric Nation and their work. Okay. So, yes. So, one question, uh, can you hear me? Can you, oh, actually, three questions. Can you hear me? Can you see my screen? And Miriam, how much time do I have now that I'm filling a gap? I, yeah, I can hear you. So I assume everyone else will will is is able to hear you. Um, maybe uh, how how long are you planning? Initially, you had 20 minutes. Is 30 minutes uh, uh, good enough, or you'd like more time? Well, let's let's aim for 30, 35 minutes. Okay, that's fine. That's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present here. Um, so my name is Lena Stahaya. I work for a company called Greenflux. Uh, and in the past three years, uh, I worked as project leader for the Electric Nation project. And I will tell you a bit more about that today. Um, uh, we have Greenflux, we have the vision. We started the company because we wanted to uh, enable driving on complete renewable energy for all uh, electric vehicles. Um, and though this sounds nice, this is actually quite complicated if you go into all the technicalities. And this project uh, contributed a little bit to that. Um, just to give you a very short background on what we do, uh, we are a white label platform provider. Uh, we currently have 20,000 charge stations connected, though we as Greenflux don't have any charging stations ourselves. So these are the charging stations of our customers. Our customers 
customers use our technology uh, in different areas of the world. Actually, I asked our marketing team to update this because Australia and Brazil are missing at the moment. Um, and currently 61,000 drivers are making use of our technology. And through a roaming agreement, uh, these drivers have access to over 100,000 charging stations. And uh, there are over 1 million EV drivers that can use our customers' charging stations. So uh, we're going somewhere at the moment. Um, this is just a quick overview of what our customers do uh, with our platform. So we do the billing and transaction management so that uh, charging stations are used that they can actually invoice to end customers and that somebody is being paid for this. Um, remote management and support, uh, the global roaming, of course, smart charging, which is the topic of today. We provide uh, a white label app and we have a lot of interfaces to interface with existing uh, systems, for instance, interface with uh, CRM systems or customers. Uh, but I won't give you a full presentation of the Greenflux system because we will talk about smart charging today and specifically the Electric Nation project. Um, but to start off with uh, smart charging, what it is, in, in essence, it's very, very simple. Um, all we do is increase or decrease the maximum charge rates uh, for an electric vehicle. Uh, there's an important nuance there. This means that we cannot set the exact charge rate of an electric vehicle. We can only set the maximum. So it's not possible to tell an electric vehicle you have to charge at 12 amps uh, because this will be very dangerous because if the battery is already full and we force it to charge, then it will actually explode. So uh, this is, of course, not allowed. So we can only set the maximum charge rate. Uh, but we can work with that. <coughs> uh, the more interesting question is why would you do smart charging? Um, there are basically four reasons for this. And I've been giving these presentations uh, for 10 years now and nobody's corrected me so far on this. So I assume this is correct. Um, four reasons. So the first of them being the grid constraints. And these could be any grid constraints. It could be the grid um, of the transmission system operator. It could be a distribution transforming station, a low voltage transformer, um, a low voltage cable. But very, very often in our case, it's uh, the circuit breaker inside a parking garage or the circuit breaker of a building where some electric vehicles are connected to. And we see currently that this is also the biggest business case at the moment for smart charging. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, next reasons, the uh, next reason is that energy prices are not constant and that we have different energy prices uh, in six or seven different markets. It depends a little bit on uh, the country you're in. Um, which you can make use of. So you play around with, uh, with when to charge an electric vehicle and actually a lot of money is to be made. Um, the business case here is not so big yet uh, due to the fact that we don't, well, that this becomes interesting when you do this with several thousand charging stations at once. Uh, there are not many parties that have several thousand charge stations uh, in their portfolio, let alone that those charge stations are all able to do smart charging. Uh, but this is what we expect to become very big in the next year or two years. This is what we're ramping up towards. Of course, you need to take into account user requirements. You cannot postpone somebody's charging for 48 hours. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about that as well today. And finally, there's the renewable energy uh, locally produced that you might want to take into account. Uh, this is always a bit of a strange one because local renewable energy has two effects. It has an effect on the grid load. It has an effect on the energy balance. So basically, we already covered them in the grid constraints and dynamic energy prices. Uh, so it's a little bit up to the local leg legislation whether or not this is interesting. Um, so if the feed-in tariff is exactly the same as you pay for the electricity, then there's really no incentive to charge on local renewable energy. But for instance, in Germany, uh, if you have solar panels on the roof, you are not allowed to feed back more than 80% of its maximum power back to the grid. So there's a very strong incentive to take into account local renewable energy. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's not so much different from taking into account grid constraints. Um, how we do this is a little bit different than uh, most of our competitors. What we see uh, mostly with smart charging is that you have uh, a local network of charging stations of the same brand uh, connected together via an Ethernet cable or an RS-485 uh, cable. And there's a proprietary protocol and this, this works okay. Uh, so, and this is usually done, if you go back one slide, uh, to take into account the grid constraints. Uh, so the circuit breakers are not overloaded. Uh, it's not possible in this way to take into account dynamic energy prices or user requirements because user cannot communicate with such a local system. 
Um, and it's also a little bit tricky that you have a complete vendor lock-in with one of those manufacturers. Because if, if this manufacturer goes bankrupt or another one is cheaper, then you cannot connect several chargers to the same uh, local system. Um, which is why, uh, and which is actually the reason why we were asked to give this presentation, which is why we do all smart charging via OCPP. Uh, this works very well. It's not that easy actually, but it works very well. Uh, the big benefit is that we can do it with any charger around that is smart enough. Um, <clears throat> and that's, uh, well, we can take into account all these four relevant aspects that I mentioned before. Um, so we quickly go over this. It, it, it's the good thing it's infinitely scalable. Of course, in reality, nothing is infinite, but um, well, we can scale it as high as you want. Basically, it's just uh, installing more server capacity works with any charge station, you can take into account any input, and very important, it's part of an ecosystem. So we can, if there are new um, interfaces to be made or relevant uh, inputs that we could use, we can always do this because we do everything from the cloud, which is much more flexible than any other system. Uh, and then of course, how we do it. As I said, in essence, smart charging is simple. Uh, later on, I'll tell you why it's not so simple, but in essence, it's simple. Very often we have uh, a maximum which we need to comply with, which we cannot uh, reach. And very often this maximum is fixed uh, because it's simply a circuit breaker in a power. Uh, it doesn't need to be. Well, I present here time and power on the axis. If you, uh, if you multiply those, time and power yields energy. So this, what you see here, is a little block of energy, specifically a block of 50 minutes with some power. Lennart, sorry yes. to interrupt you. Sometimes your voice is going um, uh, low. Maybe maybe you could speak closer to the microphone if you don't mind. That's really close to my mouth. But it's All right, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to let you know that sometimes I'm, 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 your voice is fading a bit. Okay, I can take away the microphone and let me try that and I'll, uh, I'll take it away and I'll see if the laptop uh, sound is better. Just okay. let me know. Is this better? Can you still hear me? Miriam, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Um, so, if you have this block of energy and you start charging and stacking those blocks, then this obviously is what you want to prevent. And this is basically the solution. Uh, just swap these blocks around. Um, <clears throat> so, in essence, smart charging is really not that hard. Um, you can also do this dynamically. So, I mentioned this, this red line in this graph here. Uh, can be dynamic. And this was actually a test that we did uh, for the smart charging project and the electric nation project. This was on a test location. And you see here that this line, the maximum is, is changing over time. And this was just made up randomly. This was a test. Uh, but it could, for instance, be that here you, during, during lunchtime that uh, the kitchen is using all the energy in the building. And this is why all the electric vehicles need to be ramped down. You see here that it's nicely, it's, this, this, these are real results. Uh, put into Excel, I'll admit that, but it, these are real results. Um, and you see also here that there's different uh, types of electric vehicles with different maxima. For instance, Mitsubishi Outlander cannot take more than 16 amps and it has a smaller block, while a Kia Soul can take 32 amps and it has a larger block. So this is basically what we do. Um, and just to give an example, this is uh, the head office of an Nexus, a Dutch grid operator where actually I used to work myself, um, where we increased uh, the number of charges from 16 in 2013 to hundreds in 2018. Um, and these are all 32 amp charging sockets. So 100 chargers at 32 amps would mean 3200 uh, amps. And well, the investments to, to realize these are enormous. You need to add extra transformers in the basement. They don't fit there. You have to break down bearing walls with the entire building on top of it. Uh, and this was calculated to be roughly a quarter of a million euros. Uh, well, in fact, there was 400 amps available. Um, so we completely saved uh, all, the, all the capital expenditures. Uh, so the only cost that needed to be made were the charges itself. And also uh, the annual added costs for this high grid connection are also saved. But this is why there's a very large business case. It, it's not that easy to make 250,000 euros with uh, energy trading with 100 charging stations. Uh, but they don't need to be mutually exclusive. You can do both at the same time. Very important to realize is um, even in this situation, we only intervene with smart charging about 10% of the time. Uh, so th the quickest so solution would be, well, just uh, limit each charger not to 32 amps, but to 16 amps or to 12 amps. Uh, 
um, but we don't do that because we only intervene 10% of the time, which means that 90% of the time, the chargers can charge at full capacity. And this is, this is a very important point to make. Smart charging does not slow down your charging. It actually makes charging faster. So even though you preserve the grid constraints, uh, the end user will benefit from it because uh, on average, he has a 90% higher charge rate. <clears throat> now, so far for the introduction, let's go to the Electric Nation project, um, which is, to my knowledge, the largest smart charging project ever done in the world. Uh, it consisted of 673 participants, um, lasted for two years, but to, to give you an idea how difficult it is, it took four people one year to recruit these 673 participants, after which this trial started. Um, and as you can see from this map, they were spread out all over the UK. Uh, well, not all over the UK, but all over England, um, which can only be done if you do this via OCPP. If you do this with, with a local solution, then of course you cannot put cables throughout uh, the entire nation. Uh, we're over 130,000 charging events. And the great thing about being part of this project, we were the technology provider of this project, uh, is that we had a lot of hypotheses that we thought were true, but this was finally the chance um, to, to prove them on a large enough uh, statistically relevant set. So there's very interesting results coming uh, from this project. Now in, ascension, in essence, it's more or less the same as we did in this annexes building. So this is a picture which could have been the consumption by the office building. So there's some peak uh, by the office building and it's not that much different whether it could be a peak by an office builder or the consumption by households. Uh, this actually is the consumption by households. So what we did there, uh, we measured the transformer, flipped this upside down, and then what you have below here is the spare capacity that's available for electric vehicles. Uh, everything in this pilot, let me skip back here, everything here was real. So the chargers were real, the electric vehicles were real, the smart charging was real, the locations were real, the cars were real, the people were real, the, the, uh, the issues we had were very, very real. The only thing in the transformer station we based on was real. The only thing we simulated is that we pretended all these red dots to be behind one transformer station. And this was necessary because there is no location in the world where you have this many electric vehicles behind one transformer station. So this is the only part that was simulated. So we, we pretended all those charges to be behind one transformer station. And the transformer station had the consumption as shown over here. And then uh, we allocate energy to electric vehicles, which is left over on the transformer station. Uh, this is still an example, and this is real data again. So here you have this black line, which was sent to us by Western Power Distribution saying this is the amount of capacity that you can use. Whatever you do, we don't really care, but stay below this line. Otherwise, this, uh, with the addition of the household consumption, will overload the transformer station. And we just started doing exactly what I showed you again. Uh, we started handing out packages of energy, in this case, every 15 minutes. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but at, at 6.45 p.m., there's this green block on the top starting, and you can see this is 32 amp. Next block is 32 amp. Then there's nothing there, so it has been paused for a while. Uh, continuous charging, then it's ramped down a little bit at 8.15. And then somewhere close to 10 o'clock, uh, it's full, and we allocate just a low capacity, just say, for instance, he wants to have heating uh, and use power for that or whatever. And you see that this works very well. Um, you can also see that if you who do classical insulation technology, say this is a building, then an installer would say, well, I don't have this much capacity left, which you want to use. Um, and I would not be able to charge those cars if you do it in a classical way. So here immediately from real life data, you can see the benefits of smart charging. I can charge more cars on the same network and actually have a lot of capacity to spare because I think the white area under the line is more or less the same, well, maybe a little bit closer, I uh, made a little bit less than, than the colored area. So there's, we could even add more cars here. <clears throat> um, we did three iterations with a three year project. So we did three iterations. So this basically was the first iteration of our show. We, we just started it and just let it run. Uh, people were asked to join and they got a free charger to join. Uh, it was the, and then well, they had coming what was coming to them. Um, and we just managed their charging. They had no influence over it. Um, in the second iteration, we did more or less the same, but we introduced uh, an app, a user app. And this, with this app came uh, a new function, came the high priority function. So basically had three levels, medium priority, just normal charge, and low priority if you're nearly full or already full, and a high priority, which you could request with one simple button, a high priority button. Um, and this worked really, really well. So the 
interesting thing was we were not the only technology provider. There was a second one and the other one had a more complicated app. Um, we we're very happy with that uh, because this was one of our hypotheses. Uh, the complicated app said, asked people when they were going to leave, how far their next trip was, how much energy they would need and information like that. And nobody used this because it's simply too much hassle. People don't want to go through the trouble of ending, entering all this information. Um, which was what we thought, but we've never been able to prove. Uh, but now we did, and people did not use that app, and they did use the high priority button. Um, and in the third iteration, we introduced uh, price incentives. Uh, so we said, um, well, if you charge at a cheap moment, then for each kilowatt hour that you charge, you get some money. Uh, and if you don't uh, look at cheap moments, you'll lose some money. Uh, I'll explain that in a bit more detail. Um, so this was, these people all had to say, had different energy suppliers and we would not be able to convince 700 people to switch energy suppliers just for this project. Uh, so we did not uh, include the energy providers in the project because it, it would be undoable. Um, <clears throat> so what we did instead of that, uh, we said, well, we'll have this energy rates, uh, which hold for everybody, regardless of the energy uh, provider. Uh, so on average, you said there's a 50 pence unit uh, fixed price tariff. Um, each kilowatt hour that you charge at a moment that the price is lower, you gain some money. And each kilowatt hour that you charge uh, from, in this case, 16.30 to um, what is it? 8 o'clock, um, you will lose some money because that's the expensive part. You could select this uh, via this app. And uh, the charging, uh, well, as you see there in the red search, we have the, the minimize cost option and very important, this was the default option. We know from earlier projects that people very often stick to the default option. Uh, and the default option basically said, well, I don't care about these price incentives, just charge me whenever I want. Uh, we saw a lot of people changing actually, so that this, this was a good, uh, good incentive, even though this was the default. So there were three options. Um, Oh, sorry, this was the default setting. I said it wrong. This is the default setting. This is the optimized time. Basically say, whenever I plug in, uh, just charge me. Um, <clears throat> you had the minimize cost, cost option. It says, well, if I start charging uh, in the time range between 16.30 and 22 hours, uh, then the charging will be postponed until uh, 10 o'clock. Um, and if at any other time I'll plug in, I'll charge. But say, for instance, you would start a charge session at 4 o'clock, then it would charge for half an hour and then stop charging and then continue again at uh, 10 o'clock. And there's the somewhat in, in the middle, so optimize time and cost, so don't charge at the highest rate, but uh, if it's a little bit, a little bit more expensive, then we can charge as well. Um, <clears throat> so you see here on the, on the app side, you see uh, all these different charge sessions, how much energy was charged, and some have a minus sign, some have, a, have no uh, sign, like it was a test, uh, test app. And at the end of the project, well, this was make up money because this was not actual uh, energy tariff. But at the end of the project, the uh, the award was paid out in the form of an Amazon voucher. And on, I think on average, people made like 15 or 20 pounds. But uh, the, the people that did best, they uh, scored up to 80 pounds. So <clears throat> this is what we did. Um, I've been saying a lot that smart charging is easy. Uh, and this is actually why it's not that easy. Um, so several reasons after this, I'll skip to the results. Uh, I'll, I'll switch to the results of the project. Uh, this is this is what we learned why it's quite hard actually. Um, it's crucial to have enough data uh, for smart charging, um, and there's a lot of data that you would want to have, but you simply don't have. There's a lot of university papers written on how to do smart charging, and they all assume uh, the state of charge of the vehicle to be known. They assume that they know when the car is going to arrive, when the car is going to leave, how much energy the next trip will need and this data is simply not available. So you have to come up with algorithms that do without this data. Um, also, most cars comply brilliantly with smart charging, no issue at all. But there are some cars um, which do not respond at all. That's relatively easy because you can quickly recognize that a car is not listening to smart charging and just forget about it. Uh, and the hardest parts are some cars that sometimes don't listen to this. So we were in discussion with car manufacturers about this, but of course they will say it's a charger. And uh, it's very hard to get through. So th this is very challenging. What do you do with a car that mostly complies uh, and sometimes doesn't? And then some cars are on timers, which tricked us in the beginning. Um, 
<clears throat> because we assumed, uh, well, we, we allowed those cars to charge, but they were actually on a timer because they wanted to make use of the economy seven tariff. Um, so we said, well, this car can charge. It isn't charging, so we'll assume it's full. And then we put it in a low priority. And when a, and the uh, low tariff kicked in, we said, no, you cannot charge because you're already full. So this was also, also a learning that we took into, had to take into account to solve for. Even harder are network failures, which actually happen uh, tend to happen a lot in the UK, we found out, uh, with, uh, especially with a GPRS connection. It's, it's not very saving. Um, and you cannot allow, even in the case of a power out, uh, sorry, a connection failure, uh, you cannot allow an overload. So you need to have backup scenarios for everything that can go wrong. It's very often the communication between the charger and the backend. Um, but of course, also our backend might go down. Fortunately, it hasn't happened, but it, it could happen, and we need to be able to uh, cope with that. Uh, the charger itself can go broken. Uh, the car might not respond to the smart charging signals. You have to have backup signal for everything, uh, backup system. Very important also, very often forgotten, is that uh, data costs are not for free. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, also read a lot of papers which send new smart charging signals to uh, chargers every few seconds. If you do this, then the data cost will go up to 10, 15 pounds a month per charger, and this will ruin any business case. Uh, to give an idea, we have to stick below six megabytes per charging station per month. So this is really limited amount of data, and this makes the algorithms that you need quite complex because you have to do with very limited steering signals. And also the bandwidth is limited because usually you connect charging stations via GPRS because it has the best coverage, uh, but also lowest bandwidth. So these are practical limitations that uh, make smart charging quite complicated. And skipping to the learnings. So I have six learnings here. Um, the first of all, and this is uh, by far the most important learning is, um, well, one that is technically feasible, but even more uh, important that it's acceptable to the majority of the participants. We actually got some very interesting results. Um, <clears throat> the very large majority uh, of people that were asked, and this, this was, a, uh, well, several hundred people that, that replied to this, so this has statistical relevance scored an eight, nine, or even 10 on the question, how satisfied are you uh, on a scale from one to 10 with, with the smart charging, uh, with the, the load management? And we got, well, ridiculously, ridiculously high uh, responses, which, which actually surprised me because I was a product manager. I was dealing with everything that was going wrong. So I had a completely different perception. I thought everything would go wrong. Uh, but of course, I only dealt with the problem. Um, I'm not surprised with the three to 6% that, that gave a low score because, well, this was a project, things went wrong. Uh, I was personally responsible for, I, I just made an error in our system and 50, 50 cars were not able to charge at all overnight. This is a real issue. Uh, there were some charges with a broken display. We sent out new charges and the display was broken again. Well, people are not happy if this happens. Um, <clears throat> but still, uh, a lot of people said this is completely fine and actually very fine. We, we appreciate it very much. Um, which is great news. Is if this would have been the other way around, we could stop smart charging. And well, what Miriam introduced, thinking about legislation would not be necessary because people don't accept this, then, then you're done. But fortunately, it's the completely other way around. People are very okay with smart charging. And this is great. Um, <clears throat> second one, um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of data coming from this and it's very, very, very valuable information which can be used uh, for a lot of new scenario plannings in the UK or anywhere in the world. And it also shows that, as we expected, there is a lot of flexibility in electric vehicles. Look up the figures for the UK. Um, in Britain, there are currently 40 million cars. Let's assume they will all be electrified at one point and they all charge at seven kilowatts. And we're talking about 280 gigawatts. Um, to put that in perspective, the average power consumption is 35 gigawatts. So that's 280 versus 35. So that's a huge, huge potential. Um, of course, not all cars charge at the same time, but if you would only be able to use 10% of this flexibility, then we're talking about 28 gigawatts of pure flexibility at a marginal cost of nearly nothing because people are completely fine with this. And the charges are already there and all, all it takes is six megabytes of data every month. Uh, so there's, there's a huge business case there. And actually this is, uh, I started with our mission and our vision that we want to charge all cars on renewable energy. And this is how to do it. Because you cannot have uh, a lot of renewable energy in the energy system if you're not able to have the, the, the demand follow the supply. 
And there is no demand that is as flexible as 7 million cars uh, which do smart charging. It's, this, is, this is how you uh, can stabilize the energy system with renewable energy. In it. So this is, this is great news. Third learning, <clears throat> uh, and this is also very, very important. Um, you need to inform people what is going on with smart charging and they need influence. If you don't, if you, people know that smart charging is going on but they don't know what it does, then whatever is going wrong with the charging station is due to smart charging. People have a, a pebble in their, uh, in their plug and they plug it in, but due to this pebble, it cannot completely plug in. Well, that must be smart charging. Uh, they use an invalid RFID card, it must be smart charging. The circuit breaker trip for some reason must be smart charging. Uh, and as soon as you take that away and you inform people of what's going on, um, then they're completely fine with it. Also, um, what well, we learned from the other technical part, it needs to be easy. If you don't make it easy, people will not use it. Um, and you also need to empower people a little bit that they can press this high priority button, that they have the feeling that they influence. The interesting thing is uh, they hardly ever use this. I didn't put in this data because it would be too long. You can find it in the, in the reports. That, uh, that I'll show the links at the end of the presentation. Um, in the beginning, everybody uses this button. Everybody wants to try it out. Everyone wants to be, want to be certain. Then they forget it. And they find out that they don't actually need it because the car is charged. And then we very quickly see that, uh, that well, in, in the majority of sessions, if the button is pushed uh, for high priority, then they actually need it. Because the facts, and this is also important, the fact that they have to take out their phone, open it, open the app, only it, takes, it only takes a few seconds and have to push the button, is penalty enough not to do it if you don't need it. And this is also very interesting. So there was no penalty on pressing the high priority. Uh, the fact that they had to push it was penalty enough. Uh, and we saw, we can see that from the data analytics that, uh, uh, that people don't, well, except for some cases, but they don't uh, misuse this function. Uh, so this is also what we did. This is our own white label app, uh, which we provide to our customers. And it's used for finding charges for roaming and paying, but very important also smart charging. You see it here on the right. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but there's a prime button there. Uh, Actually, this is old layout. We just uploaded a new one. It's called Charge Assist. You can just download it from the, from the Play Store. Um, <clears throat> where on charging stations connected to the Greenfield platform, you can push this button and this is, this is the high priority button. So we took this learning and put it into our offering. Um, <clears throat> fourth one is a very interesting one. Uh, so this was from the third iteration where we introduced this time of use era tariffs. It's highly effective um, and also very dangerous. Uh, so <clears throat> these are the results. Uh, so these orange, what you see here, these bars are the, the moments that the transaction started. So these orange ones are the normal distribution. So you see a lot of people that come home in the evening, five or six o'clock, and they start a transaction. And then this decays overnight. Um, <clears throat> and the blue ones are the start of transaction uh, in the trial three where we see a huge peak at 10 o'clock, which as you might remember is when the low tariff uh, kicked in. Also, if you look at the energy consumption here, <clears throat> you see the energy uh, peak at noon, uh, sorry, at noon, at six o'clock, uh, from six to nine is completely shifted to, uh, to 10 o'clock in the evening. This, this may not seem like a big shift, but remember that the household peak is also there at six o'clock. So we shift all this consumption uh, to a later stage. So this is a huge success for the grid operator. However, for the energy supplier, this is, this is not so good. Because imagine, um, well, 40 million cars, let's say in five, five, six years in the UK, we have 5 million electric cars. Imagine doing this with 5 million electric cars and there's a sudden increase of 35 gigawatts at 10 o'clock in the evening. This will for sure cause a blackout in the UK uh, because there's no way that the energy system can suddenly deliver 35 gigawatts of power. Uh, so the good news is it's with a very easy incentive, uh, it's, you can have a huge result. Um, the caution is be very, very aware what incentive you give. And um, personally, I can go into much more detail, but I would need more time. Personally, I don't believe that dynamic energy tariffs applied directly to end users will ever work uh, because of this effect. Um, so what I think you should do and what we are currently offering, so we have the Greenfield platform, we take it to a ground to grid limitations. 
Uh, and within these grid limitations, we can do energy optimization. So we have a connection to the energy supplier or the balance responsible party uh, who is connected to the wholesale market. And we take input from them via um, the Open Smart Charging Protocol or Open ADR or a custom API, it doesn't really matter. They tell us how they want the group of electric vehicles to be charged based on their uh, wholesale position. And the incentive to the end user should not be a dynamic energy tariff because we can get the effect that everybody starts charging at the same time. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's probably much more robust to just give the end user a fixed discount or free charger or have them save for towels or whatever. Um, but you know, basically buy their flexibility for long term. So just you know, in, in a fixed count. Maybe, maybe give them one pence of, of discounts per kilowatt hour anyway. There's, there's different ways to do that. Fifth, learning. <clears throat> I showed you a lot of graphs with blocks stacked to each other and these were 15 minutes blocks. Uh, this was our old algorithm, but we couldn't change it halfway the project. Uh, where we just collected all the all the data, all the inputs, and then collected it up to the next 15 minute block and then calculated a new profile. This is not ideal. For instance, uh, if somebody pressed, uh, did a high priority request, we would say, uh, yes, thank you. It will become active within 15 minutes. Well, this is not what you would expect if you press a high priority button. Um, also, when somebody started a new session, uh, it could take up to 15 minutes before the car actually started charging because we needed to wait uh, for the next calculation run, whether or not this was possible. Um, so we started with this system, 15 blocks, 15 minute blocks. And what we've now switched to is a completely event-based algorithm, uh, which looks a bit more uh, challenging. And it actually is a lot more challenging because if all events can occur at any given time and you have all parallel processes, this is, uh, this is a nightmare for our developers, but we've cracked it. Uh, and as you can see, it, it, it becomes more interesting or developers call this smart. Uh, but the good thing is with this, we can now uh, directly respond to events, offering much more uh, versatile solutions. So the easy things are whenever a session starts or stops, we can react to that. When EVs are nearly full or full, uh, we, we respond directly to high priorities requests, either from a driver or a charger. But also do more smart grid integrations, like put DC charging uh, stations in the same network as AC chargers, or when there's a sudden change in available capacity from a grid operator, maybe a power line went down and it needs to be, the power needs to ramp down immediately within a second. Uh, so the, the scenarios that we can support become much more interesting also towards uh, the transmission system operator or the balance responsible party. But this is, this is a learning that we took uh, that was very important, um, but not that easy also. And uh, maybe the most important one is um, the technology is ready. And again, Miriam mentioned at the beginning of this webinar that uh, the UK is, is looking into legislation. Um, that's that's a tricky part. Also that I could talk for a long time about, but then, uh, then it would take up too much time. Uh, but the technology is not the issue. We can apply this. We can, we can use OSPP. 2.0 is fine, it's nice, but version 1.6 already suffices which is supported by, by the vast majority of charging stations. Um, and it's there. And if we go back at these four reasons why you would do smart charging, which I started with, um, well, this is quite simple. <laughs> so we, we take a building, we measure what's going on there, whether there's local production or what the building is doing. And, and we'll take that input. We take the user input via an app. The energy supplier input is, as I mentioned, via OSCP or open ADR or, uh, and, an API and the same goes for the for the grid operator and we turn that into smart signals to well this this shows only one charger but to a bunch of chargers and the technology is no longer the issue and the customers that we already have uh, can already make use of this uh, this technology um, <clears throat> to finish so what we we did not stop after this so we'll continuously update our algorithms do further integration with apps uh, with, with third party apps metering platforms and charging stations and we are currently rolling this out uh, commercially so this, this has been a very good project for us we learned a lot and um, <clears throat> that's it uh, so these are my contact details uh, please also visit those uh, those links over there uh, oh I see this is a typo they both project summary actually the top one is uh, the project results this is a lengthy report of 591 pages so um, uh, take the time to go through that, but every detail is there. If you're really interested, please read this because it's very, very, very interesting information. If you have less time, then the project summary is 32 pages, also very interesting. 
Uh, I think this was it. Lena, thank you so much for sharing some of the insights. That was excellent. Uh, one thing I picked on is uh, you mentioned uh, some cars do not respond to char smart charging and other cars are on timers. Uh, the legislation in the UK will mostly uh, look into chargers rather than cars. And when, you, when what you said is really important for us to realize that we might have the best legislation there is, but it's not targeting uh, one entity uh, that could cause what we're trying to do to fail. So thank you for that. Yeah. If um, participants have questions, please do write them in the group chat and we read them out at the end. Uh, and I'd like now to uh, invite uh, Ben to start his presentation. And Ben, I'll unmute you now. Hi. Can you hear me? I, uh, yes, I can hear you. Great. Okay. Uh, let me just share the screen. Oh, I think Leonard has to stop sharing. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you see my screen? Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yes, yes, I can see your screen. Yes, I see. Great. Okay. Okay. I'll try. To, I'll try to go quickly so there's enough time for questions. So, I thank thank you for this opportunity to briefly tell you about some of the work um, we're doing uh, as part of a Bayes funded innovation trial where we're trying to use uh, Open ADR and OCPP together um, to enable smart EV charging in UK homes. Um, Carbon Corp, uh, it's a bit of a strange organization. We're certainly not a very big organization. Um, I usually describe this as an energy services cooperative. So we're actually a membership-based organization uh, uh, based in Greater Manchester in the UK. And we provide uh, various different services to our householder and small business members um, with a focus on the deep retrofit of buildings, which is very extensive um, energy efficiency measures, uh, as well as more recently smart energy, which is what this work falls under. Um, so the name of the project that I'm going to be talking about today is Open DSR. Um, it's, a, as I said, a UK government funded project to develop a, a system for um, demand side response based on open source and stance based uh, technology. Um, and we're using both Open ADR and OCPP uh, inside of it. It's specifically focused at enabling the control of multiple um, appliances uh, simultaneously in homes and small businesses. So not just one appliance, uh, but dealing with cases where there might be both, say, an electric vehicle charger and some other appliance, like a heat pump or a battery. Um, so just quickly, I know previously in these webinars we've talked about Open ADR. Um, uh, Open ADR is a is a protocol uh, and a standard for um, exchanging information to enable demand side response activity. And in, in very practical terms, it just involves the exchange of XML messages between uh, different machines. Um, and you can see in this diagram the sorts of uh, actors who are involved, who may be involved in open ADR exchanges. Um, the messages themselves, they contain, can contain quite a range of different information, but usually they're quite focused on uh, describing demand side response events. Um, I think it's quite important to point out, and this was uh, highlighted in a previous webinar, that the, the standard is very much focused on information exchange rather than explicitly on control. So the, the clients and the servers that are involved, they're, they're not slaves to each other. Um, um, it's much more about te informing different systems about uh, the, what's going on and then they expecting them to deal with that information themselves. Um, so this is a picture of the uh, architecture of our system um, before we tried to add OCPP into it. So because we have multiple appliances, um, 
in in the home we 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 have introduced uh, an energy management system here um, alongside uh, the smart appliances themselves um, and this is connected to our back-end services by various means we have the open adr link but we also have uh, an additional um, channel which is required for um, communicating certain telemetry and also enabling the provisioning of the devices which isn't something that OpenADR deals with. But OpenADR, apart from those things, OpenADR can be used for most other purposes in enabling the demand side response. Um, so we, in, in doing this, we, in implementing this, we have to uh, heavily modify and update uh, an existing implementation of OpenADR, um, which itself has been around for quite a few years now. Um, and we've also needed to integrate a, a public key infrastructure solution for handling the issuance of TLS certificates, which are required by um, the OpenADR standard. Um, as well, in, in addition to this, we've added a management API and um, created a created a sort of a, a process flow to enable the provisioning of the clients. Uh, these are all not necessarily things that are included in OpenADR and which you have to uh, add on to it. Um, just to reflect on, uh, off this initial period of development on our experience of using OpenADR, um, uh, it's showing its age a little bit in terms of security. I, I think uh, it relies quite heavily on uh, the use of uh, TLS um, public key infrastructure, um, whereas uh, these days, it's uh, much more common for web services to obtain SSL certificates for free. Um, um, in, in our implementation, we've, we've used uh, the common public key infrastructure of, of Let's Encrypt for the service certificates, and then we only sign the client certificates with our own keys. But it's worth saying that this isn't consistent with uh, OpenADR certificate policy, even if it represents better practice. Um, it's also worth pointing out, if you're going to use OpenADR, that there is a, a very useful program guide, which they provide, which uh, outlines, I think, quite clearly how the specification can be used to um, enable various different use cases, including EV charging. Um, and flexibility markets in a more recent update. Uh, on to OCPP then. So uh, having implemented our system using OpenADR, it's um, certainly over the last uh, 12 months become increasingly clear that we, in the UK in particular, need to be able to uh, interoperate with EV charges, which are implementing OCPP 1.6. Um, and as this is now, a requirement in, to meet the minimum technical specification for OLEV approval of EV charges uh, in the UK, which is required if you want to receive installation grants for your EV charger. They're, in the minimum technical specifications, they will also allow a functionally equivalent standard. But given that the manufacturers have to demonstrate how the alternative standard they're implementing uh, is functionally equivalent to OCPP 1.6. I think we're expecting most manufacturers to simply implement OCPP 1.6. Um, it's worth saying that this, uh, this doesn't mean that the OCPP 1.6 has to be uh, added as a capability of the charging unit itself. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, charging, uh, charger manufacturers adding this in a separate device which uh, then connects to their chargers, which adds this functionality. And this, is, uh, this seems to meet the requirements of the OLEV um, technical specifications. Um, further to that, I'd, and, I mean, we, we've been doing um, some work to both add uh, OCPP uh, capability to EV chargers, but also to um, enable it on, um, on the server side. So, We've, we've seen there's a, there's a range of different ways of, of getting this onto um, existing EVSE systems. Uh, the most obvious one is to put it on the charger unit itself. 
um, and we, we've, we've been doing some of that work with our um, hardware partners. And But the second option, as I was just explaining, is to add it to um, some sort of hub or first party management system. And we've seen uh, a lot of the charger manufacturers come out with um, products which look like this. The, the one that we're perhaps more interested in here um, is is trying to add support to a third party management system um, and this is um, this is necessary if your uh, system integrator like we are um, and you need to uh, interoperate with an existing uh, smart EV charger which supports OCPP um, which will become increasingly common uh, in the field going forward um, so whereas open ADR was mainly concerned with uh, the exchange of information and signals about demand side response events. Um, in OCPP, there is certainly more of an uh, emphasis on uh, the control uh, of, of the EV charger and the EV itself. Um, but in, in the use case we're looking at where, where the control needs to be uh, delegated to a management system in the home or, or, the, or the business, then some sort of uh, interface is required to the charger and where um, the, the option is either to talk OCPP to the charger or to, um, or to uh, there needs to be some alternative interface available. Um, and this, this inevitably leads to uh, needing to uh, implement some sort of OCPP server on, on the management system um, itself in order to talk OCPP to the charger. Um, and this is uh, this is what we've uh, this is what we've ha had to do in this trial. So we've had to effectively um, develop a thin appliance which can run on a home or a building uh, energy management system, which we can register the EV chargers to, which we can then use to control the chargers. Um, I I would accept that, and this isn't a, really an intended or desired use case of um, OCPP. Um, in practice, because currently it's being recommended uh, in these UK government technical specifications, or at least in the OLEV ones, um, in, in practice we, we need to work with the charges in this way uh, in order to uh, enable this use case. Um, so this is uh, then what the architecture looks like um, with OCPP added. Um, so you can see the OCPP server there running uh, running now on on the uh, management system so and, that, and that's how we uh, going forward plan to interoperate with charges which only support the um, only support the OCPP as the open interface so our plans uh, for this year going forward um, is our demonstrator activity for this project uh, begins um, in April 2020, so we're, we're hoping to deploy these systems in uh, between uh, 50 and 100 houses, um, primarily in Greater Manchester and primarily uh, in our in our membership base. Uh, houses which, generally speaking, have multiple uh, electrical appliances that we can control. Um, uh, and as you probably noted on, on one of the first slides um, as, as the, the sort of goal and the objectives of the project to, to see how far we can get with using open source technology um, we're, we're also planning to release all of the uh, software that we uh, have modified or developed as part of the project probably sometime early in 2020 uh, and this will include our um, Open ADR implementations, as well as this uh, OCPP fin appliance I've been talking about. So that's uh, that's all I had to say. Um, thank you for listening. I'll hand it back over to Miriam. Um, questions? Thank you, Ben. Sorry about that. I was struggling to unmute myself. Uh, would you mind just going over quickly 
about what did you mean you had to develop uh, something to add on the charger to allow OCPP to work? And after well, that, I'll take some of uh, the questions which I counted five so far. Sorry, yeah, it's it's not. Um, so we, we have we have developed um, OCPP uh, capability for a specific charger unit, but my my comment was more that if if we encounter any uh, smart EV chargers according to the UK definition in the field, um, then we're we're expecting that that will probably be the only. Uh, universal interface uh, in the short term that we'll be able to communicate over. So we need to not add something to the charger itself, but we need to be able to interoperate with it in some way by effectively running a server locally. Um, that's that that's if uh, you know it's being used in this in this sort of way where we want to connect it to a management system in in the home. If it's just connecting to a charge point operator um, somewhere in the cloud, then it's quite that that isn't necessary. So they they have their own OCPP server, and it will be connecting directly to that. So moving forward, other uh, other companies developing, let's say, similar solutions to yours, they would need to develop their own local server. Do I understand this correctly? If, well, if if there are no other options, so if if, um, if if they're a third party and they need to communicate with a third party charger unit, and there's no other interface that's available on that unit, which is which is quite typical. Most units don't have open interfaces that you can use to control them. If OCPP is all that's available, then some sort of uh, some, something like this is required then. It's, okay. it's, it's what makes OCPP a bit of a strange choice for domestic chargers in a way. Um, but there is no alternative, is there? Well, there can be. It, it just depends on the, the manufacturer. So some manufacturers may provide an alternative interface. Um, that is open? That, that may or may not be open, yes. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll move on to take questions. Um, we have a question from Guillaume. Uh, he's asking, I assume this is for Leonard, uh, how can you bring the amperage down to zero while J1772 minimum is six, six amps? Yes. Am I unmuted? No, no. You, uh, we can hear you, Leonard. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, well, this, is, this, is, this needs to be handled inside a charging station. So via OCPP, you can simply send zero amps. It's true that you cannot send two or three amps. Everything between zero and six is not possible. Uh, but a charging station can handle this uh, by, uh, within the mentioned protocol, you need to send a 100% PWM signal, uh, which will render the uh, car to a different state, basically a pause state. Um, so it's 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 a different state than the normal uh, control, but this is this is handled by uh, by the charger. But this is indeed one of the reasons why we do not simply uh, send smart charging signals to every charging station because we want to thoroughly test a charging station before we trust that it's able to do smart charging. This, this is more than just implementing OSPP. You need to really understand uh, how cars behave in this respect. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Nina, uh, and I also this is for Leonard. Uh, Leonard, you you mentioned that uh, you you have around six megabyte per charge point per month of data transferred. Uh, is this uh, the event based, so as opposed to fifteen minutes? Is this still compatible with a six megabyte limit? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, we use less data uh, with the event-based system because we can send much more targeted information. So we're now down to four or five megabytes uh, per month. However, this depends a little bit on the use case. So in a lot of use cases, the 15 minutes or five minute basis is fine. Um, if you do a wholesale position uh, smart charging, say, portfolio on the, on the day market, or the intraday market, or even on the second uh, reserve market, we have to stay within balance in the in 50 minute blocks, then it's fine. 
if you go to, for instance, a frequency containment reserve um, where you have to send updates to a TSO or have to respond every second, yeah, there's, there's really no way around it that, that you start spending more data. Uh, and then you seriously have to look at the business case. Um, but in most use cases, and I think the most important use cases, uh, we actually use less data and it works very well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, this is also for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, what is the flexibility potential from electric vehicles? Did you say 10 gigawatt? Um, <clears throat> no, I said if all electric vehicles, uh, sorry, if all vehicles in the UK are electrified, uh, the, the figures for each country are auto, they're more or less the same uh, relatively. If all 40 million cars in the UK are electrified uh, and they all can charge at seven kilowatts, um, then seven times 40, uh, 7,000 times 40 million is, is 280 gigawatts. Um, what they combinedly uh, represent. Of course, this is only true if they are all charging at the same time, which is not the case, but if you would only be able to use five or 10% and we're talking about 14 to 28 gigawatts of pure flexibility, which is nearly for free. Um, well, to put this in perspective, the total average power consumption of the UK is 35 gigawatts. And then you have 28 gigawatts of, of free flexibility. But this, is, this, this has huge value because any other source of flexibility will come, will do not, does not come for free because it's from power plants that require coal or gas or it's from utilities that need to be shut down, which cost money. Um, so th there's, there's, not, there's nothing like the flexibility of electric vehicles, both in uh, cost and both. Okay, thank you. Moving on to some security and privacy questions. Maybe we start from Ben. I've got a couple of questions asking you using OCPP 1.6. How come have you not considered OCPP 2.0? Well, that's simply because uh, we're, we're focused on uh, smart charging in the UK and 1.6 is specifically referenced in the te minimum technical specifications for um, OLEV. That's, that's the main reason. Would it be hard for you to migrate to OCPP 2.0? Because I, I, am, I, uh, I think they're not backwards compatible, are they? Like, uh, you have, are I, you, have, you, have you considered uh, using OCPP 2.0? Not, it's not a very high priority at the moment, just due to the fact that it's not uh, the focus of uh, implementing you know, smart charging standards in the UK at the moment. Okay. Uh, then question on security back to uh, Leonard. Uh, Leonard, are you are you uh, considering to adopt participate in a public key infrastructure to ensure the security of the digital communication? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, I am not a security expert, so maybe I'm going to say something dumb. Um, but uh, from what I know about the public key infrastructure, it's that important because uh, the the communication from the charger to the platform should be secure. But I think again, I'm really not an expert. Um, well, if you hack our platform, then you can communicate with the charger anyhow, anyway. So this, this needs to be very secure. Uh, so assuming this is what I said is correct, uh, then the public key infrastructure is really there that the, the charger cannot do any damage. And um, from this point of view, well, I think if you do your best and you're a good hacker, then you can hack a charge point, uh, but you can't do that much damage with it. Uh, so it's, it's just one single charger. So from that perspective, if you, uh, well, if, if we talk about security, we really focus on the security of a platform because you could do real damage if you would hack a, a platform. Uh, but single charger, the worst case scenario would charge for free. Are, are you using OCPP 1.6 or 2.0? 1.6. Um, <clears throat> well, are you implementing additional security measures? Because 1.6 does not <laughs> automatically include the security measures like 2.0. No, that's true. But again, from the same perspective, um, uh, we we communicate via uh, nearly all cases via uh, via SIM card. So we're in the VPN network of the telecom operator, which is very secure. I'm not really worried about uh, well, man in the middle attacks on on, uh, on this VPN system. 
Uh, so we're securing that part. And, and again, I'm, I'm not too worried about somebody hacking uh, a charging station and doing damage because it's just one single charging station. Reason why we use OSPP 1.6 is very simple. There are hardly any charging stations in the world. If you look at the volume, so there are a lot that use uh, um, that, that currently support OSPP 2.0. So there are some that use it. But if you look at the volume of charges in the world, then it's a very low percentage that currently support OSPP 2.0. Uh, so we, we are a technology provider. So we are technology agnostic in that sense. So once our customers uh, start asking for 2.0, we will definitely implement it. And, and on, on Electric Nation, you are controlling chargers from different makers, I assume. Uh, now, in this case, uh, the charges were supplied by Alphen ICU. <laughs> by uh, well, Alphen ICU. So they were the same charging the charger brand. Yes. And they are yes. those chargers all implemented OCPP. Yes. And so that's, well, it, that's just from a project management perspective yeah. that they did not want to deal with too many parts. So uh, a condition of Electric Nation was that the consumers would install this charger. Uh, in our cohort, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and the other with the other technology provider, there were chargers from Circ as well. But then, if let's say those customers uh, installed a charger that also communicated with OCPP from a technical perspective, you would be fine, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. As okay. long as they are smart enough. So yeah. Yeah. Supporting OCPP is one thing, but you also need to support the communication to the car in the proper way. This is okay. a real test. Uh, sorry, say that again. So supporting OCPP is one thing, um, but handling the communication to the car in the, in the right way is also something that we need to thoroughly test. We just For instance, uh, there are some cars that if you pause the charging for 15 minutes or so, then they fall asleep. Uh, and you need to wake them up via the right sequence in, in OCPP. It doesn't often happen. It's not often necessary. But if you just stick to the protocol, uh, in this case, the mode two, call in IEC 61851 or the equivalent J1772. Um, if you just stick to the protocol, then it will not work uh, because there are still cars that just need a little bit more attention. So this is, yeah, this is a practical experience we need from charge point manufacturers. Is this information available in this 500 page report? Uh, I don't think so, no, sorry. <laughs> okay, you had to keep it at 500, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I didn't write it, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have um, uh, one privacy question for you. Uh, what is the minimum required data to make sure this can work? Like, do you have to collect ID, credit card number, location, or you can do with a bit less, uh, uh, with a bit more, let's say, anon anonymity? Uh, well, we do, can do with a lot less anonymity. Um, so for smart charging, we don't need credit card information whatsoever because smart charging is not related to payments. Of course, when you do payments, then with credit cards, then there's some security there. But basically what happens, happens uh, someone has a deal with a credit card provider and there's these high-end security devices that communicate with them. And basically, we get a signal from the credit card handler or whatever they call the payment service provider uh, saying, this is okay, you can start charging at this socket. And we don't even know who is there. Um, from smart charging, it's more or less the same. We don't really care who is at the charging station. We just care about the car that's connected there. And also, if there's a high priority request, for instance, from a user, we don't know who this user is. We just know that at this specific socket, there is a user that needs a higher priority. So from, from that point of view, there's really little information we need. We just need to know what's going on on this specific socket. Okay. Uh, I have a question about, is a, is, can we build a single cloud solution for all chargers? I'm assuming this means how scalable is the, uh, uh, how scalable can we get? I mean, before I hear both your opinion or your answers on this, I just say that key here is open communication protocols. And as long as we have the chargers uh, communicating using an open protocol, then the entity controlling them can coordinate with another entity and another entity. But again, I'd like to hear what you think about this. Um, well, of course, you can build one single cloud solution for all chargers. That, that's technically feasible, but in, in a free market, that's, that's not possible. Uh, okay. And that's also not desirable. Uh, yeah. And if it would happen, then there would be European Commission intervening, probably. Yeah, well. like you don't want to, yeah, what happens no. if it breaks or, yeah. What, ben, what do you think? <laughs> well, yes, I would agree it's uh, not desirable. I think, I think the most important thing is that 
there's portability between uh, between the charge point operators. Um, well, this this is mainly impacting on those who are running commercial charging stations, but maybe domestic users as well. Okay. Uh, I have uh, one uh, last question, but before that, I wanted to check with you. Are we able to uh, share your slides with the participants? Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, if some participants uh, wanted to ask you more questions on one thing, is that okay if they contact you? Yeah, that's fine yeah, well. with me. Great, okay. So my last question is for both of you. Uh, clearly, we need state of charge that comes from the cars. Otherwise, uh, charging management of these cars is not really optimal. If we don't know how much energy is left on this car, how can we really decide when to charge it? or uh, when to discharge it in case of vehicle to grid. Uh, right now, it's not easy to get state of charge out of the car unless you're using Chalimu. How do you think we can move forward where we get this cr crucial information? Well, let me disagree there. Go on. <laughs> if you're going to say ISO 1511A, no, 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 no. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, earlier, uh, earlier. Um, uh, okay. you said clearly we need a state of charge. Um, I'm not convinced that this is true. Okay. Because the state of charge information is is rather useless without uh, knowing anything about the user. So it's a very dangerous assumption that somebody who has a 20% state of charge has a lower priority than somebody who has an 80% state of charge because you don't know anything about this person's intentions with, with this car. So I think the value of a state of charge information is, is overrated and it's only valuable in combination uh, with input that needs to come from a user. And whether this comes via an app or via the car in ISO 1511.8, in the end, it will still need to be the user that enters this information in some system. But we still and need we state know. of charge, no? Like, <laughs> Sorry? We still need state of charge. No, we don't. How can, how, how can you do a, an optimal charging control strategy if you don't know what is, on the, uh, what is on the vehicle? Ideally, I don't want to rely on the user entering this information because they might forget, they might enter it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so we actually don't use the state of charge in our algorithm because we don't have it. Um, well, I'm not going to disclose every little, every little thing in our, in our uh, system, but let me give you a hint. Uh, it, it sounds very trivial, but we know that a car that has been working for a while is fuller than it was before. That, that sounds like an open door, but it's actually very important information. Uh, we also know that a car uh, whose charge rate is starting to decline has, an, has a charge rate uh, of 80% or higher. So th these types of information is, is what we use, uh, but we cannot, yeah, we cannot get the, the state of charge information and the state of charge information is, is not worth that much without user input. And we know from experience that we cannot get the user input. So we, we have to build better algorithms that do, can we do without it. So takeaway point from you here is that state of charge from the car is not as important as we think it is? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, <laughs> well, and the next call to that uh, is, is basically what I always make to all the universities, uh, stop copying each other and start building algorithms that do without it, because we could really do with those. Uh, you mean like start thinking of ways to deal with this without relying on the state of charge of the car? Yes. yes. Ben, do you have any input on this? Um, I, I also would tend to agree that the state of charge is overrated. I think you can... I think you can get quite a long way without it. Um, but but apart that issue, is, but that aside, uh, I think without some significant change in the charging uh, hardware and the protocols, I think maybe you could envision uh, some sort of um, additional radio-based uh, data information exchange between the charger and the car as a possible solution. Just, just, just uh, as an idea. How is? Can you say that again, please? Just, just some uh, uh, dedicated, uh, dedicated car to charger link that is formed when the car is near to the charger, which could exchange this information. You, using what medium? Uh, there's lots of possible options. I mean, you could even, I don't know, Bluetooth or 
I wouldn't use Bluetooth, but maybe you could use something like that. Okay. But this 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 could be cheaply added to a lot of charging stations and wouldn't require a change to the to the hardware of the charging station or. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Ben Leonard, uh, for this very useful uh, uh, presentations and insights. Yeah. And I also like thank to you. thank our participants, and we'll make uh, the recording and the slides available online this week. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.